Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I think um, it's time we start the session. So thank you so much for joining. A very good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, thank you so much. This is, the session today is called the grassroots responses from the COVID-19 frontline. Um, and the session, uh, next slide, please. So the session is part of uh, the initiative called Voices from the Frontline, which is a joint initiative by International Center for Climate Change and Development and Climate and Development Knowledge Network, CDKN, and which also feeds into one of the knowledge components of uh, Global Resilience Partnership, GRP. So we thank you everyone for joining today's session. Before we start um, our main session, I would like to quickly go through a few housekeeping rules. So the session is being recorded from the very beginning and will be made public. And um, if you want to speak and want to add something with any of the speakers or with the ongoing conversation, please raise your hand so that our session host can unmute you. But um, uh, in otherwise, you can always use the chat box to ask questions and comments and feedbacks. And in any case, if you feel any technical problems, please write to mimansha at gmail.com. She will uh, take care of the problem and try to fix as soon as possible. And I would request you all to kindly be fully present during this session. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope the session will be a very interesting and engaging one. I really uh, hope that you all be actively participating during the session. So now I would like to invite Dr. Shanaz Musa, the director at the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, to start the session with her opening remarks. So Shanaz, over to you. Thank you. Th thank you, Shireen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, as mentioned, I'm Shanaz Musa, director at the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, CDKN which is a program that is coordinated by an NGO called South South North. We're based in Cape Town, South Africa, and we run the CDKN in partnership with regional partners, ICLI South Asia, FLA in Latin America, and ODI. The funding we run the program with is from Canada's IDRC and the Royal Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was it's with great pleasure that I welcome you today on behalf of CDKN, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, the Global Resilience Partnership and Slum Dwellers International to this session about grassroots responses from the COVID-19 frontline. And it's really great to see some old friends in the list of attendants and a special welcome to all our old friends. Today, we will be joined by esteemed colleagues and leaders from Bangladesh, Kenya, and South Africa, who have been working for months now to support grassroots responses to COVID-19, and who will share their responses to this crisis. CDKN and ICAD are collaborating to share the stories and experiences of communities in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and we call the series Voices from the Frontline. What has been emerging from these stories is that rather than powerless victims and beneficiaries of assistance, local community leaders and the grassroots organizations are leading their own efforts to respond to the crisis. They're using their own resources, their own social networks, knowledge and strategies that they have used to respond to historic and previous shocks. Often they are responding to COVID in the face of multiple other shocks and stresses, such as cyclones, environmental pollution, and even locust plagues. They are not just dealing with COVID. We've already published 16 stories to date, and you can find them on the ECAD and CDKN websites. And I'd like to encourage you to visit the websites and have a read of these stories. What is particularly striking about these voices from the front line is that local people are articulate and specific about how external assistance could be designed and delivered to fill the community needs that they, ha that they have identified and which they cannot fulfill themselves. 
community members are best placed, or, and this is what we've seen through the story series, to contribute information about their local needs and to connect with programs run by and resources and resourced by government and external actors. Communities are very eager to share their knowledge and engage with external agencies as partners to co-create solutions, but often their voices are not being heard. So this story series is part of a wider effort led by the Global Resilience Partnership with other partners, including Slum Dwellers International, to work with these grassroots organizations and partners to help reposition the role of grassroots organizations as agents of change and recognize the critical value in building a more resilient post-COVID-19 world. This is so that external organizations, governments, donors, NGOs can better understand and strengthen, strengthen these local actions and voices and support existing leadership and capacities of communities that are there. So not creating new, but working with what there is. These short stories are shaping an emerging set of messages that will be taken into various fora moving forward. Amongst these will be the Climate Adaptation Summit, which is hosted by the Dutch, and this will be happening in January 2021. And which it also builds on the work of the Global Commission on Adaptation. And like I've said before, it is important that these voices are taken further and into the global conversations that are happening. I'd like to encourage you, if you know of any organizations and or individuals supporting COVID-19 responses, and would like to contribute to the series of stories, to please ask them to get in touch with ECAD and CDKN. The link to the email will be shared in the chat box for you to please pass on. Shireen Manon from ECAD will be leading us through the rest of the session and we really look forward to some interesting and engaging discussions. I would now like to hand over to my colleague Lucia from CDKN and she will talk us through some housekeeping rules and take us through a quick exercise so that we get to know each other better, albeit a virtual setting. So thank you and over to you, Lucia. Great, uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Shana said, I'm uh, Lucia Scudanibi, also working with CDKN. So um, let us get to know each other a little bit at the beginning of the session. So we will have a couple of interactive exercises to see where everybody's joining from. So we would like to get a bit of a sense of uh, the countries that uh, uh, the participants that are today joining us are, um, are coming from. So um, you will see that in the chat box, uh, a link to a Padlet map will soon appear. But before you click on it, please uh, do look at the screen because we would like to show you how this works. So you can see that when you click on that link, you will end up on this map. You can then go to the top right hand corner where the pink plus is. And if you press on that, you can then type in the location where you are joining us from. So, um, for example, we see that uh, Clemence is from London, and then you can type in your name and the organization that you work for. So this is Clem, and she is uh, joining from IAD. Then you can click anywhere on the map, and uh, your entry will be saved. And if you want to zoom out, if you go to the bottom right hand corner, you will see the little minus and you can go back to see the, the whole world. So um, do come back though to the Zoom room because we will be sharing our screen so we can then look together at who is joining. So um, please do go into the chat box, uh, click on the link and fill in so that we have a sense of where everybody's from today. And we can start to see, once you come back to the Zoom room, that uh, the map is starting to fill up. I see a few participants from Europe, 
from um, we see oh somebody from Tanzania and Kenya possibly from India oh wow the map is definitely filling up so let's say hi to a few people if we click on some of those pins we will be able to to say hello so for example Oh, we have an anonymous person who didn't put the name and organization from Bangalore. <laughs> we have somebody from Singapore, oh, from the Huayra Commission, Anwesha, hello and welcome. Anwesha Tewari. We have three people joining us from South Africa. Oh, Sumiti, that's a, an old friend as well. <laughs> Hi, Sumiti from Cape Town. From Uganda, we have Godiver. Oh, from the Women Climate Centers International, welcome. We have somebody from the Netherlands, from Utrecht, but we don't have the name. <laughs> um, if by any chance you are unable to open the Padlet, it may be because of your browser. So I do recommend that you use Chrome or Firefox. On Explorer, unfortunately, it does have a glitch, the Padlet app. So um, if you have been unable to, uh, to fill in, that may be the reason. Or you can just copy then the link and uh, put it on a, on a different browser, I'm afraid. But um, that's great. I think we have a good sense. Uh, apologies for those of you who could not manage, but uh, I think the, the map is looking more populated. So many of you did. So that is great. So um, let us do something different now. We would like now to see the organizations you are joining us from. So you will see now a Mentimeter appear in the chat. And you can please uh, click on that link. And then once again, if you come back to the Zoom room, we'll be able to see the types of organizations um, that you are joining us from. So um, let us see as it starts to fill up. I hope you have all seen the link in the chat box and that you are able <laughs> this time to fill it in. I don't see yet anything changing. I hope that uh, the links are working and that uh, it's just uh, still in the process of happening. Oh, here we go. So we have um, at the moment the same uh, numbers from international NGOs and research organizations or think tanks or academia. We have some donors, we have some from the national government and three from our community-based organizations. That looks great. I think some of you are probably still in the process of filling. Yes, it's increasing. I see 19 of you have filled so far. So um, research organizations are the, um, the ones that are leading the way for now and think tanks. Let us maybe have a final refresher to see if, um, if more of you have managed to fill in the Mentimeter. Hmm, a few more. Okay. Yeah, so we, uh, I think we have um, a good range, which is nice, so like from NGO, government, donors, uh, and uh, community based organizations, and then more international partners. So I think that looks great. And that should contribute to some uh, rich discussions. I also see many of you are introducing yourselves in the chat. I think that is great. But uh, yeah, let me pass back on the microphone to to Shireen, who will take us through uh, through the session. Welcome again. Thank you so much, Lucia. I, th I thought the interactivity session was really interesting. And also we have a lot of them introducing themselves in the chat box. So I think there's a really good mix of uh, people coming from different um, uh, sectors and different organizations. And I hope the session today will be a really intriguing one. 
So um, before proceeding to our main session, I would like to quickly give a quick outline of our session. So today our session is divided into three segments. The first one is a storytelling session where we will have three speakers coming from three different countries, sharing their stories of building community resilience at the time of COVID-19. And then we will have uh, four breakout room discussions to have an engaging um, in-depth discussion around uh, scaling up the issues, uh, scaling up the grassroots initiatives, and then followed by a reflection section where we will have representatives from FCDO and CEDA to share their reflections on the issues discussed and identified throughout the session. Uh, next slide, please. So during the storytelling session, if you have any questions, comments, and feedbacks, please feel free to put that in the chat box. But uh, in addition to that, we also have, we will have a Padlet uh, question running. My colleague will put the Padlet link to the, uh, to the chat box shortly. And Clemens, if you can quickly show the screen with the Padlet questions on. So if you, if you click on the link shared by uh, my colleague uh, in the chat box, you will be taken to this, uh, to this page where we have three different questions. So our, our three speakers will uh, talk about their roles in building community resilience, but we all know that beyond that, there are a lot of roles that the grassroots groups play during um, uh, any crisis in building resilience. So you can just click on this plus button and uh, post your uh, comments or your responses. And the, and when a comment is put, anyone can put a like on this on that comment as well. So after that question, we also have a couple of questions on what are the enabling factors or the strengths that uh, allows these uh, participants to succeed in, in their interventions and what are the challenges and constraints that they face. So while listening to the speakers, we would really appreciate if you can populate this uh, sheet with your thoughts and feedbacks. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Yes, so um, let me just quickly uh, welcome you all to our first storytelling session, learning from community change makers at the COVID-19 frontline. Today, we will be having three speakers, Ishrat Shuli from Bangladesh, David Silakan from Kenya, and Rose Molokwane from Cape Town. Next slide. So the first intervention that we would look into is uh, the one by Ishrat Shuli. So we will watch a video that she has very kindly prepared, us, prepared for us, highlighting her intervention on ensuring food security during the time of COVID-19. Um, Ishrat Shuli is a freelance journalist, a researcher, a filmmaker based at Dhaka, Bangladesh, but she also runs a community school at her locality, which um, uh, looks after the community, the informal slum dwellers and their children. So um, there are a lot of interesting uh, stuff that Shuli is doing. So Clemens, if we can start uh, showing the video. Thank you. Shuruta. Jokhan shara prithi bide koronar e mahamari arambu hulo. একটা পর্যায়ে গিয়ে বাংলাদেশেও তার প্রাদুর্ভাব ঘটলো তো তখন আমরা সিদ্ধান্ত নিলাম কয়েকজন বন্ধু মিলে যে আমাদের তো কিছু একটা করতে হবে আমরা মানুষের জন্য কিছু করতে চাই তখন আমি ফেসবুকে একটা স্ট্যাটাস দিলাম যে আমি স্বেচ্ছাসেবক হিসেবে কাজ করতে চাই এই বিষয়টি নিয়ে আমাদের কথা হচ্ছিল কয়েকটি অর্গানাইজেশনের সাথে আমি কথাও বলেছি ট্রেনিং নেব কিভাবে কাজ করব এই সমস্ত বিষয় নিয়ে আমি দেখলাম যে আমার বাড়ির আশপাশে প্রায় শখানেক পরিবার আছেন যারা খুবই নিম্নবিত্ত এবং তাদেরকে দিনমজুর বলা যায় আমি দেখলাম যে তারা ভীষণ রকমের বিমর্ষ হয়ে হ্যাঁ খুবই দুশ্চিন্তাগ্রস্ত কাউকে কিছু বলতে পারছে না কিন্তু তাদের মধ্যে প্রচণ্ড হতাশা তখন আমি একদিন তাকে তাদেরকে জিজ্ঞেস করলাম যে কি অবস্থা আপনাদের কিভাবে চলছে তখন তারা বলল যে আপা আমাদের তো কাজ নাই আমাদের কাজ নাই মানে খাওয়াও নাই মানে খাওয়া দাওয়া নাই এরকম উপস যাচ্ছে তা আমরা কি করব। তখন আমার মনে হলো যে আরে এই মানুষগুলোর জন্যই তো আমি করতে পারি কিছু একটা তখন আমি বাইরে কিছু করার চাইতে আমার মনে হলো যে আমার আশপাশে যারা আছেন তাদের প্রতি আমার বেশি কর্তব্য তখন আমি সিদ্ধান্ত নিলাম যে এনাদের জন্য আমার কিছু একটা করতে হবে তারপর আমি আমার বন্ধু 
বিথি ঘোষের সঙ্গে আলাপ করলাম আমরা আলোচনার এক পর্যায়ে আমরা দুজনে মিলে সিদ্ধান্ত নিলাম যে আমি যেহেতু লকডাউন পড়ে গেছে এবং আমাকে কোথাও যেতে হলেও আমার একটা সমস্যা তারপর আমি সিদ্ধান্ত নিলাম যে আচ্ছা আমি স্বেচ্ছাসেবক হিসেবে কাজ করতে চাই এবং এদের সঙ্গেই কাজ করতে চাই এরপর আমি আমার বন্ধুদের সঙ্গে আলাপ করলাম অন্যান্য বন্ধুরা সবাই হাত বাড়িয়ে দিল প্রথমে আমার এক বন্ধু ওদের জন্য রান্না করা খাবার পাঠিয়ে দিলেন সবার মধ্যে আমি লিস্ট করলাম সবার সবার ঘরে ঘরে গিয়ে তা আমি যখন সবার ঘরে ঘরে গিয়ে লিস্ট আরম্ভ করলাম তখন আমার বন্ধু বান্ধব স্পেশালি হাসি বালি বর্ণা ভীষণ রেগে গেল তুমি খবরদার বাসা থেকে বেরোবা না যদি বেরোও তাহলে তোমার খবর আছে তোমাকে আমি একদম মরতেই তো চাও একদম মেরে ফেলবো তারপর ওকে আমি বোঝালাম যে দেখ আমি যদি বাইরে যাইও আমি কিন্তু আমার প্রোটেকশানটা নিয়ে আমি যাচ্ছি এবং আমি জানি যে আমাকে কিভাবে কিভাবে যেতে হবে তারপর আমি দেখলাম যে এখানে সখানিক ফ্যামিলি এবং এই সখানিক ফ্যামিলিতে প্রত্যেকটা ফ্যামিলিতে তিনজন চারজন পাঁচজন সাতজন এরকম পরিবার মেম্বার সিদ্ধান্ত নিলাম যে ওনাদেরকে একটু আমি করোনা বিষয়ে যদি একটু সচেতন করতে পারি ওনাদের সবাইকে নিয়ে মাঠে বসে করোনা বিষয়ে বিভিন্ন করোনার যে সচে সচেতনতামূলক যে বিষয়গুলো আছে সেগুলো নিয়ে তাদের সঙ্গে আলো আলাপ আলোচনা করলাম দেখলাম যে ওনারাও অনেক কিছু জানেন আরেকটা বন্ধু কে বললাম খাবার টাবার দেওয়ার জন্য আরেকজন দিলেন এভাবে রান্না করা খাবার আসছিল পরে দেখলাম যে রান্না করা করা খাবারে অনেক সমস্যা হয় গন্ধ হয়ে যায় বা কিছু একটা হয় তখন আমি আমার অন্যান্য বন্ধু বান্ধবদেরও বললাম যে তোমরা আমাকে হেল্প করো আমি এরকম ওনাদের জন্য কাজ করছি তখন আমার এক বন্ধু ও একশো ব্যাগ চাল মানে প্রতিটা ব্যাগের মধ্যে পাঁচ কেজি করে চাল ডাল তেল আলু পেঁয়াজ এগুলো পাঠিয়ে দিল পাঠিয়ে দেওয়ার পর দিলাম তারপর আরও অনেকেই মার্জিয়া প্রভা আরও অনেকেই চাল ডাল তেল নুন এভাবে পাঠিয়ে দিতে লাগলো তো দেখলাম যে নাহিদ নজরুল নাহিদাপাও পাঠালেন চাল ডাল সবার জন্য তো আমি দেখলাম যে যে চাল পায় তারা হয়তো দুই দিন বা তিন দিন তাদের চল চলে তখন তারপর আবার শেষ হয়ে যায় তারপর আবার কি খাবে সেটা আবার আমার আবার আরেকটা হেডেক তৈরি হয় কাজ নাই আর কাজে গেলে হচ্ছে রাস্তায় গেলেই পুলিশ হচ্ছে দৌড়ানি দেয় দিচ্ছে পুলিশ মারধর করছে কেউ কেউ মার খেয়েও এসছে পিঠে দাগ নিয়ে এই অবস্থা তখন আমি চিন্তা করলাম যে আচ্ছা এই যে খাবারগুলো চাল ডাল যে আসছে এটাকে যদি আমরা নিজেরা একটা যৌথ রান্নাঘর করি তাহলে বোধ হয় আমাদের যে টেনশানটা কম হবে তখন আমি যৌথ রান্নাঘরের আয়োজন করলাম আমাদের এখানে সামনে অনেক খালি জায়গা ছিল খালি জায়গাতে আমরা হাড়ি পাতিল নিয়ে একটা অস্থায়ী চুলা তৈরি করে সেখানে রান্না শুরু করলাম সবাই অন্তত আর যাই হোক অন্তত এক বেলা বা দুবেলা আমরা তো খেতে পারবো যেহেতু আমাদের এখন খাদ্য সংস্থান নাই তো সেভাবে শুরু হলো রান্না বান্না আমরা শুরু করলাম অনেকেই আমাকে সহযোগিতার হাত বাড়িয়ে দিলেন যাদেরকে চিনি বন্ধু খুব কাছের বন্ধুরা তো আছেনি যাদেরকে চিনি না এরকম মানুষও আমাকে সহযোগিতা করতে লাগলেন এভাবে আমরা রান্নাঘর চালাতে শুরু করলাম তো এর মধ্যে প্রধানমন্ত্রী একটা ভাষণ দিয়েছিলেন যে বাংলাদেশের এক ইঞ্চি জমিও যাতে খালি না থাকে সবাই মিলে চাষ করবে তো সেই জিনিসটা আমার একটু ক্যাচ করেছিল তখন আমি এই সবাইকে নিয়ে এক একটা গ্রুপ করে তারপর আমরা মাঠে নেমে গেলাম হাল চাষ করবার জন্যে মাটি কেটে সবাইকে নিয়ে আমরা চাষ শুরু করলাম বীজ বুনলাম বীজ বোনার পর হচ্ছে যে আস্তে আস্তে চারা উঠতে থাকলো আমাদের একদিকে খাওয়াটা চলছে প্রতিদিন আবার হচ্ছে যে আমাদের চাষবাসও চলছে এভাবে গাছ থেকে আস্তে আস্তে ফলন শুরু হলো আমরা সেই ফসল তুলে এনে আমরা আমাদের রান্নাঘরে কাজে লাগালাম সবাই মিলে খেলাম ভীষণ একটা আনন্দের বিষয় মাঝে মাঝে একটু টেনশন হয় তারপরে আবার কোনো না কোনোভাবে কেউ না কেউ আমাদেরকে হাত বাড়িয়ে দেন Thank you so much for sharing the video, Clemens. I think that was really interesting. And uh, uh, thanks to Isha that she has kindly made this video for us, highlighting the interventions that she has taken. Can. Just to let you know, on beyond ensuring food security, um, Ishrat also runs a community school and particularly looks after and educate the, educates the slum uh, children. And uh, she has been successfully doing that for quite a while. Um, one interesting factor about um, Ishrat's uh, story that I thought is she initially started single-handedly and with some short-term um, interventions like providing food reliefs and food packages. But later she realized that this is not going to last and she needs to think something uh, sustainable by engaging the community 
That's when she um, initiated the community kitchen and later the community garden. I think this story is really inspiring and motivating for us as well, uh, so that we can also think of uh, doing something for um, these communities, particularly urban slum dwellers who are, um, you know, in the front line and uh, extending supports during the time of crisis, but um, hardly get recognized or gets any. Um, interventions from our end. So thank you very much, Shuli. We also have Shuli with us today. If you have any questions and comments for Shuli, please put that on the chat box and we can come back to you during the question and answer session. Now, um, uh, Clemens, next slide. Yes. So uh, our second speaker is Mr. David Silicon from Kenya, and he is the coordinator at Pastoralist Alliance for uh, Resilience and Adaptation in Northern Rangelands. So David, I would now request to you to start your start speaking and if possible to uh, turn on the video thank you uh, good morning everyone good afternoon good evening people all over the globe um, when COVID is David, we can't properly hear you. Maybe you can turn off the video and speak if that helps. case that was in the demand of for people actually who are from the urban world because they would run away from you an urban disease so okay <clears throat> good morning of uh, uh, semi-arid and arid areas and then you know water scarcity and all other issues of conflict natural resource based conflict is quite rife there and it's bordering uh, parts of uh, Ethiopia and you, you experience that also Somalia and so infiltration of in small arms is also an issue there. With COVID-19, the first case was recorded in, uh, in the month of March and the stigma and the information was not very clear for us here because people thought that uh, this is a, an urbanite disease and people would think that if you come from the, urban, the, the city or from anywhere, you are the one who is contracting the disease or you bring the disease to them. Unfortunately, and fortunately for us, we were able to do uh, a lot of awareness using um, the WHO guidelines and protocols, the government also regulations, using radio technology, uh, that's uh, using our local community, local radios. Um, we would use also some uh, pre-recorded messages. We would do uh, campaigns like, okay, like um, using the public address systems mounted on vehicles just to make sure because knowing the fact that the 98% of where we work, they're very illiterate. So we would actually make use of the local language and also music so that have been uh, developed in such a way that to send the messages that COVID is there. And um, communities have all already organized themselves and they try to use uh, the local hubs you know, to prevent themselves from contracting the disease. But unfortunately, some of these uh, hubs, uh, they would think that they getting um, brewed liquor like vodka, the local vodka here would heal you from uh, or will prevent you from getting the disease or getting uh, a cup of tea with the three teaspoons of salt. And then there are so many misinformations that were not actually correct about COVID. And uh, currently that uh, they, knew, they have understood uh, how COVID is transmitted they have really taken a lot of precautions, even sleeping outside because those small hearts are very uh, congested and you have aeration is very small, is very little. And so we, they would sleep in observing this, uh, this space that is uh, actually required. For our organization and the organizing the communities, the communities have been able to put resources together. We were able to provide PPE materials uh, equipments, uh, foodstuffs, um, go sit with them and talk with them 
and also use the radio messaging and even texting and even dramatizing from other from other alliance members they use drama to do that they would also use um, like uh, women's songs to create awareness on that so i think communities were very 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 fast to address that knowing that the kenyan government was not really prepared for this pandemic so the community took up to the roles and they actually would tell you don't 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 let don't get me corona and uh, the greeting in terms of hands greeting because we are also social people within our setup we live in uh, we live with the uh, communities that are extended families so you find that uh, okay if you one person gets uh, the contracts the corona i think it will spread so fast but i think the cases in northern kenya were very fewer than in other areas because of the precautions that the people took up and uh, took up the initiatives to make sure that they do not get that um secondly one of the issues also is also the change of behavior in terms of uh, in terms of the area where we are that has minimal water washing hands you know it's quite really difficult because you have to get a 20 liter gallon of water and then it's very far away that you can get that water so it's actually something that they took the initiative because they, they said if it is washing hands and we have scarcity of water how do you make sure that we don't get corona how do you make sure that we have our own hygiene so we, in terms of that people are very cautious and uh, the awareness has also been part of the campaign by women especially women the young people and the elderly are very much so much scared that they will tell you don't come closer to me so those are some of the mechanisms that built uh, that made them uh, uh, the spread of corona not to actually pronounce it in, in northern kenya Thank you so much, David. Um, I thought that was really interesting the way you highlighted that how um, your alliance and other uh, grassroots leaders have fought against the misbeliefs and particularly. Yeah, one, one of the yes. Uh, do you like to add something, David? I think we have lost him, but uh, David, you can put in the chat box if you want to add additional comments, and I can well, certainly I think that get we back. It's always the able policeman here, and because of uh, the uh, sexual harassment of young girls along the, the cities, was also something that we experienced, and also we saw bribing and all ma all all illegal activities happening now. Was even drugs uh, addiction, trans trafficking of drugs from the border of Ethiopia coming all the way, and police being bribed. So we had all those uh, issues happening within this COVID-19. Thank, uh, thank you so much, David. I think we are a bit um, ahead of time. So I think I have to cut you here, but I can get back to you during the question and answer session. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And we really um, appreciate the fact that the way you and other grassroots organizations against the misbeliefs and traditional beliefs and also the rising number of gender-based violence, sexual harassment, and the rising number of uh, drug addiction and crime. I think we also need to recognize that during the time of crisis like COVID, we have uh, you know the immediate public health impacts or the economic impacts, but there is also a uh, silent rise in terms of uh, social conflicts and social challenges. So we also need to keep check of that and fight, uh, fight against them. Thank you so much, David. Um, uh, Clemens, if you can put the slide on. Yes, With, uh, on that note, I would like to call upon our third storyteller, Ms. Rose Molokwane. She is a coordinator at the Slum Dwellers International. Um, Rose, if you can um, unmute yourself and start speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to explain myself and my organization around this pandemic. When this coronavirus came into our communities, it was just a surprise because people were not anticipating to get this kind of sickness. But nonetheless, because SSDI, we have been organizing ourselves for all these years in order for ourselves to be 
in the knowledge of how to live our lives. When the pandemic was affecting our communities, we started to come together and say, what should be done? We are there on our own. It is affecting our families. It is affecting individuals. And what is it that needs to be done to really address this challenge that has come all over the world? What we did was that we listened to the regulations that governments were giving us, hand washing, using of masks, social distancing. But you know, a lot of people will never agree on that because if you don't get sick, you don't agree that the sickness can affect you. So that was the main problem that we are facing with some of the people in our communities. Nonetheless, what we did was that we started, as others are saying, we started campaigning, educating our people to understand the danger of this pandemic. We used the pamphlets and the posters to educate our people. We went around visiting especially our members of the federations to understand the difficulty that we are facing because of this pandemic. The other thing that we were looking at was that, what about those who are already affected? You know, in our organization, we've got old people who know what they were doing in the past when they get sick. They will advise us on the herbs that needs to be used to address this sickness for those who are being infected. And we started to use that. I remember my son was also infected and I started to use those apps and then he, get, he got cured. And then because we realized that it's important for us to have our meetings visually like any other people in our organizations, we started to share the information on how we tackled this pandemic when it has infected some of our members. Social distancing is another difficulty in our communities, especially in informal settlements, whereby a lot of people are staying in one shack. And how do we think they will get that social dis distancing done in their shack? Like for instance, in South Africa, the, the government did have, especially the Department of Human Settlement, did have what they called command council that came up with ideas of thinking that they will address the dense population of our people in informal settlements. Unfortunately, they couldn't reach their target that they wanted to reach because they never engaged the people when they decide to do what they call de-densification, meaning that uh, it was a silent eviction or a silent uh, relocation of the people. But because people are not, uh, they were afraid, they have been locking themselves in their houses. So it was not easy for them to agree with our government to move out of their shacks, to go to their alternative, uh, what they call temporary shelters. It was a difficult task because people were not shared information about this particular process. But what we came up with also as the organization through SDI and specifically in South Africa, we agreed to, to produce ourselves our own sanitizers. We used our own mixtures that can create alcohol in it. And then we were giving it to each other. We then go to the government to say, we need your support on this. That's when a drop in an ocean from their support came into our communities, but it couldn't reach out to the most vulnerable and the most needy people in numbers. That's why we agreed to use our savings. You know, in, in SDI, we use savings as, as, a, as, a, as a tool to mobilize and organize ourselves. But because we were, we were faced with this problem, we advised each other to say, let's take our savings and also our NGO. They should now decide to reallocate the funding that they had to support the activities 
so that we address directly the issues of this pandemic. So we started to utilize our savings to have food parcels for our people, to have sanitizers for our people, to create masks for our people. But, and, and we also address the food security for our people, making soup kitchens, giving out food for our people who are sick, visiting our sick people. But we engaged our government even though they were not listening. So what I'm trying to say is that we are continuing to address this pandemic. We are continuing to use the data that we are collecting to identify the problem. But the challenge is the services that the government were supposed to be delivered to our people. We struggle to get water. We struggle to have better sanitation. We struggle, we struggle to have garbage collection in our different communities, but we continue to help each other in addressing all these issues. I'm supporting all my, my, my colleagues who were giving the presentations, exactly what they are doing. Poor people are innovative. Their initiatives are getting better and better. We only need the support from the funders, from government, from everyone who is ready to support our initiative that we have started. We have built a very strong movement as SBI. We empowered women to address this pandemic and it is getting successful. But the challenge is the buy-in from our government. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much, Rose, for that excellent delivery. I think um, everything that you have said, are, are, we are totally in agreement. And this is interesting. I have found one interesting factor is that one, when David was uh, speaking, he was, um, he was saying they had to fight against certain traditional beliefs of, you know, having those means beliefs of having, um, you know, locally brewed whiskey or vodka to get rid of the virus and all that. But in your case, the traditional beliefs actually work for you that you um, use those herbs and herbal medicines to get cured and in fact you you had the first hand experience of curing your son from the COVID-19 uh, disease so this is really interesting and I also like the way you have put the challenges as well that uh, you are all in there with uh, um, all networks all supports and all data but you always um, don't receive uh, the uh, the essential support from local government and national government. I think this uh, this particular issue is very well put on today's session because on the next segment, we will also be discussing how we can scale up these issues at different levels. So with that note, I would like to thank uh, our three speakers for sharing their excellent interventions with us. I think our participants have also thoroughly enjoyed. And now we will um, open the floor for a quick question answer session. I think we have uh, uh, already have quite a few interesting questions in the chat box. I think first I would like to go to David. Um, the first question, David, that you have is, um, ha have the traditional and uh, family structures strengthened during the time of COVID-19? I mean, in, in your community, has this, uh, family structures and bonds have been strengthened during the COVID-19, despite the absence of um, effective government support? And the second question for you is, um, has the COVID-19 pandemic motivated people to take more lead to act uh, during the climate change, on the area of climate change adaptation as well? So, David, over to you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Sharon. And I think the family structures are still very strong now because family units have been reunited. People came all the way from the cities and they went back home because they were afraid of uh, uh, the sickness, the, the corona because it spread in the cities. So they went back and reunited with their families. And then we have been having um, intergenerational uh, ceremonies that are happening whereby within the, that COVID-19 people were brought to, came together and then uh, they, they would learn their tradition, they would learn their respect for elders. And I think now we are more, 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 more stronger in terms of traditional governance structures than before. When it comes to the issue, you said the second question was um, about the initiatives of the communities. The people have gone back to their bio enterprise and looking at the, 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 the species of plants that they used to take, especially for women when they are pregnant. Uh, 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 the elderly in, in terms of bone formation, the, you know, they have all those things. They think that of the, these herbs can, could treat them or could it make them become better immune to several things. 
And then the other thing that brought about also the issue of locust, the, the response to locusts was also something else that the communities were responding and they really went against the spraying by aero spraying because they lost livestock, they lost uh, uh, perennial grasses. So the, the communities are also coming together and also challenging the systems. Thank you so much, David. Um, we have uh, one quick comment by Misha, which is, I would like to understand if there have been any community initiatives that have involved measures other than food packages, hand washing and sanitizer distribution. I would also like to understand how we access what our communities need from uh, us as their partner organizations. So I would like to quickly reflect on that, uh, Misha, uh, that uh, uh, in our Voices from the Frontline initiative we have already published more than 15 stories which um, addresses issues other than uh, delivering food packages and hand sanitizers, you know, like issues like the youth-led interventions, um, community mapping, and then uh, fighting against gender-based violence. So I will share the link to our uh, site in the chat box and you can go and uh, read all these stories. Uh, Rose, now I would like to uh, go to you. The one question is, uh, from Vincent uh, is that for all types of building resilience to COVID and climate change, how do we attract the attention and support of government to provide the services? So Rose, as you were speaking about having less support and coordination from the government, can you elaborate how, uh, how organizations like you and SDI can get more support and more um, you know, commitments from the government? Thank you very much again. I, I think we have a very important and strong tool that we, we use as SDI, which is data collection, community survey, collecting stories from different communities. Because we are talking about partnerships, we always go to our local government, national government, use our data to make them understand of the needs of the people. Yes, it doesn't happen as we wish, but in some of the communities, there are those municipalities, local government who are listening to what we are showing them from our, our data collection. Like for instance, in South Africa, we did have this NGO that supported us through IB, IBP, meaning international budget participatory program. And then we use that to identify and survey all the services that the people are needing. In some of the areas, we were able to sign memorandum of agreement with some municipalities who started to work with us. So my, my answer to that question is that we have to continue to be strong to collect information because information is power and then power makes you to be able to engage with the external world. So what we need is the buy-in, the real partnership that we are trying to forge with local government and national government and also outside funding agencies. Because if government is not ready to help, but communities are ready to do something for themselves, to be self-reliant, is there's a need for funding agencies to also tap in to support what uh, communities have already started to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rose. Uh, I think that was excellent. And I think we will uh, have uh, this discussion forwarded in our next segment. But before that, maybe I can quickly go to Ishra Shuli. And a few of you wanted to know more interventions apart from food reliefs and distribution of um, uh, masks and uh, uh, protective cures. Um, uh, for uh, for the ease of uh, Isha Shuli, I would like to translate the question to her in Bangla and then again translate her answer uh, in English to you. Isha, do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. 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 Yes, I hear you.
কোভিড ১৯ বা করোনা এটা হচ্ছে একটা পার্ট অফ লাইফ কিন্তু এর বাইরে যেটা ওদের জীবনে কিন্তু সারাক্ষণই চ্যালেঞ্জ কোভিড ১৯ তাতে কিছু হেরফের নাই মানে তাতে কিছু যায় আসে না কারণ মহিলা যারা এখানে বাস করেন স্পেশালি মহিলা এবং বাচ্চারা খুবই ভার্নারেবল অবস্থায় আছেন তারা হচ্ছে যে হাজবেন্ড মহিলাদের যারা হাজবেন্ড আছেন তারা হচ্ছে যে বেশিরভাগই দেখা যায় যে ড্রাগ অ্যাডিক্টেড এবং মহিলারা হচ্ছে বিভিন্ন বাসায় কাজ করে বা মেসে রান্না করে অথবা আরো নানান রকমের এরকম ছোটখাটো কাজ করে তারা সংসারটা চালায় এবং হাজবেন্ডরা দেখা যায় অনেক সময় যে যে ওয়াইফের কাছ থেকে টাকাটা নিয়ে সে নেশা করে আসলো বা দিতে না চাইলে স্ত্রীকে মারধর করলো এই ধরনের সিচুয়েশনের মধ্যে আছে মহিলারা আর তাদের যে বাচ্চারা মায়েরা হচ্ছে ছোট ছোট বাচ্চাদেরকে রেখে কাজে চলে যায় চলে যাওয়ার কারণে এই ছোট বাচ্চারা একা একা এই চারপাশে এই বাড়ির চারপাশে ঘোরাফেরা করে এদের কোনো পড়াশুনো নাই কোনো কিছুই নাই জাস্ট খাওয়া দাওয়া ঠিক মতো হয় না আর নিজেদের মধ্যে ঝগড়াঝাটি করে কেউ কেউ রাস্তাঘাটে পড়ে গিয়ে মরে যায় মানে এরকম একটা অমানবিক অবস্থা শিশুদের তো তখন আমার মনে হলো যে এই শিশুদের নিয়ে আমি কিছু একটা করতে পারি তখন আমি এদেরকে সংগঠিত করে বাচ্চাদের শুরুতে আমি তাদের নিয়ে গল্প কবিতা তারপরে নানা রকমের নাচ গান এগুলো করতাম পরবর্তী সময় ওরা খুব ইন্টারেস্ট পেলো তখন ওরাই আমাকে বাচ্চারাই আমাকে উৎসাহিত করলো যে তুমি আমাদেরকে পড়াও এই তুমি আমাকে আমি নিচে বাসা থেকে নিচে নামলেই আমাকে বলতো এই তুমি আমাদেরকে পড়াবা না মানে এরকম তখন সেখান থেকে আমি স্কুল তৈরি করি একটা ঘর তৈরি করি বাচ্চাদের পড়ানোর জন্য তো ওরা খুবই ইন্টারেস্টেড বাচ্চাগুলো এখানে আমি পড়াচ্ছি ওদেরকে এখন ওদেরকে কোনো রকমের চোখ রাঙানি নাই মারধর নাই জাস্ট ওদের আনন্দ মতো ওরা পড়ে এবং ওরা খুবই রিসিভ করে যে কোনো ভালো কথা রিসিভ করে যে কোনো পড়াশুনোটা খুব রিসিভ করে খুব চমৎকার মানে দেখা যায় ভদ্রলোকের বাচ্চারা হয়তো পড়তে চাচ্ছে না ঘ্যান জ্ঞান করছে কিন্তু ওরা তা করছে না ওরা খুব আনন্দের সঙ্গে স্কুলে আসে এবং মাঝখানে বন্যা ছিল বন্যার কারণে হচ্ছে যে আমি ওদের বাড়ি ঘর পানিতে ডুবে গিয়েছিল এবং আমার স্কুলটাও পানির নিচে ছিল তো পানির নিচে ভেসে গেছে স্কুলটাও তো আমি তখন ওদেরকে ক্লাস করাতে পারিনি বাচ্চাগুলা আমাকে দূর থেকে দেখতো এবং আমি ওদের কাছে যেতাম পাগল হয়ে যেত ওরা স্কুলে আসবে বলে এখন আমি আবার স্কুল ঘরটা করছি এই বাচ্চাদের এবং দেখা যায় যে আগে যখন আমি ওদেরকে ক্লাস করাতাম ওর মায়েরা হয়তো কাজে চলে গেছে বাচ্চাগুলো সারাদিন কিছু খায়নি তা আমি চেষ্টা করেছি ওদেরকে দুপুরে এক বেলা খাবার দেওয়ার ব্যবস্থা মাঝে মাঝে সবসময় তো সম্ভব না আমারও ব্যক্তিগত লিমিটেশন আছে আমি ব্যক্তিগত পর্যায়ে থেকেই করছি বা কোনো ফ্রেন্ড হেল্প করলে তখন করছি তো দেখা গেছে ওদেরকে যদি দুপুর বেলা একটু খাবার দেয়া যায় আহ ওদেরকে যদি একটু ভালো জামা কাপড় দেয়া যায় এবং এই বাচ্চাগুলোকে যদি পড়াশোনা করানো যায় তাহলে এই বাচ্চারা হয়তো আমার দেশের একটা আরো ভালো একজন মানুষ হয়ে গড়ে উঠবে ওরা থ্যাংক ইউ শিউলিয়াপা um uh, so uh, participants let me just quickly translate what shuli has just said so she basically works with the urban informal settlers and slum dwellers who uh, live a very miserable life and uh, live hands to mouth and most of them are daily wage earners and particularly the women most of them are uh, uh, domestic workers they work as house helps in um, you know affluent people's um, houses but um, in most cases these women are the sole earner in their family and their husbands are mostly uh, often they don't have jobs or, or they don't uh, you know they don't want to do the job because their wives are earning and uh, since the wives have to be uh, on work for a long hours so it also increases the rate of domestic violence and it also creates a, um, a bad impact on their children as they are detached from their parents for uh, the entire day and they roam around in the in the roads without any education and no proper guidance and food so realizing all that shuli has started a community school uh, in her locality with her own budget and and rented a, a, a small hut there and she started uh, first engaging these local uh, uh, children by uh, uh, with all those uh, some cultural activities some poems and then she also started providing um, you know formal education but then uh, we, uh, she was faced with the urban flooding situations we had uh, a prolonged draining uh, situations and it resulted in um, urban flooding and then she had to uh, close her school for a while but then again she as when situations grew better she again started the school but she is saying she has her own limitations in terms of budgets and capacities to run the schools so she also um, see support particularly from the government and other NGOs and um, aid agencies if they can come forward and help people like Shuli who works uh, uh, wholeheartedly with the communities and marginal people particularly for the children and in their education securing their life. 
Um, if you have any questions or any feedback to Shuli, please feel free to post it on the chat box. I think um, we are by the end of our question answer session. Now I would hand it over to my colleague Ida, who would quickly guide us for the next segment, the breakout room sessions, and then we will be divided into four breakout groups for um, in-depth uh, discussion. Thank you, Ida. Over to you. Yes, thank you, Shireen. Um, okay, so for this next session, we'll be going into four breakout groups, and you'll be automatically sent into these groups. Each group will have one facilitator, and you'll have 20 minutes to discuss one question, and then come up with three solutions to this question. And then we will report back into the main plenary and wrap up from there. Thank you. Our session host will now create four breakout rooms. Please hang in there for a while as, and you will be uh, located in one of the breakout rooms and uh, soon talk to you there. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming back to the uh, to the plenary. I hope uh, I, I thought that was very quick, and I think we should have uh, we should have allocated a bit more time for the breakout session. But uh, nonetheless, I think we had a good discussion, and maybe we can quickly uh, brief on um, the 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 three solutions that each group has identified uh, from the breakout groups. Maybe we can put the slide on. Yes, uh, so maybe I can quickly go through. Uh, this, this looks a bit messy though, but I'm sure we can all, uh, you know, have brief and highlight the points that uh, we have identified. So the, uh, our, as you all know, the breakout groups were divided uh, into four rooms where we had to point out, uh, we had to look into how we, uh, how we scale up the initiatives and in local, national and global level. And finally, how the transparency and accountability issues can be checked um, throughout the process. So I was facilitating the room one where, where the questions we lo looked answers for was how should local government work more closely with grassroots groups to co-create solutions. So the first um, uh, solution that was uh, unanimously highlighted by all the participants that the grassroots groups are able, they have a large network and they are able to provide real-time updated data to the local government, be it in terms of uh, targeting the actual um, candidates for support, be it other hazard or risk related data. Uh, Myri was highlighting that how communities can provide data on um, the locations of floods and flood hazard mappings as well. So that is one top solution. The second one is the local governments can provide technical supports and trainings to um, the grassroots communities. And this can be a three-way partnership where the local government can work together with local universities as well, as well as the grassroots groups to kind of uh, co-create the capacity building manuals and trainings and support them with the devices such as the smartphones or internet packages and make all the capacity building training. and. Um, other important issue was the issue of legitimization and support that uh, the local government should recognize, uh, first of all, the grassroots groups and the amazing works they have been doing and also legitimize the data that they can formally use it and also provide a platform for the grassroots groups where they can, uh, you know, work together, co-create solutions and the grassroots groups can also involve in the decision-making process. So these were the three solutions that were identified in room one. Now, Lucia, if you could, you could go to, the, to your slide. Sure, yes, um, I no longer see the slide, <laughs> but um, I can look at my own version. Like, I don't think the slide is anymore on the screen. Um, I think it will appear soon in any case. So we were addressing the questions, how should national governments work with grassroots groups to ensure their policies are informed by local realities, given the disconnect we often see between like national policy making and the fact they undermine what happens at a local level. 
So um, our group, uh, which uh, was uh, great and very participatory, uh, suggested that uh, we need to use uh, grassroots and community structures, uh, like for example, women groups uh, or like the SDI network or like these already organized groups uh, so that the voices of them like uh, can be can come into policy decisions. Um, we also were suggesting, like uh, given the example in Kenya, that uh, like um, there is a stronger push for government to, to put in place like formal decentralized and devolved structures. For example, we see like the the county structures that exist in Kenya, and those uh, can ensure that there are formal governance processes to have like more consult yeah consultative processes happen. So they can also get voices like um, uh, heard. Um, however, we also recognize that sometimes even when there are these like formalized governance processes, they actually do not lead to implementation and action. Like sometimes they're there, but the consultation does not happen. For example, in Bangladesh, we had we heard. So I think it's quite important in that case to ensure accountability. So that means that like the grassroots groups, like the, um, the NGOs, the CSOs really need to demand accountability when those like structures already exist. And also like we had like a bonus one, <laughs> I see it came with a dollar sign, um, to really consider areas where government is not in control. Like uh, because uh, sometimes uh, like uh, ethnic controlled areas do not have like these formal, um, yeah, governance structures. So they should also be, we should also think about how things occur there. Yeah. Excellent. Either, yeah. Yes, I was in charge of room three. Um, I see that we're really short on time here, but I'll try to make this one quick. So my group was also very participatory and we had the question, how can international aid agencies ensure resources directly reach the most vulnerable? We came up with three solutions. Um, there's a need to bridge the gap between donors and grassroots organizations, possibly by inviting them directly to meetings or um, also by not having such rigid criteria that um, local groups cannot meet. Another one is donors to work directly or work through an alliance of organizations like SDI and uh, to forge better relationships with grassroots organizations. And lastly, it's important to work with um, the national and local governments for these countries. Thank you. Shababa. Hi, my name is Shababa Hawk. I was in charge of room four. The question, uh, we had a really good discussion and we heard a lot of really important points. So I tried to capture these three. Um, so the question that we had in hand was how can grassroots groups keep track of transparency and accountability of all the external actors involved? Uh, so the top three points that came out are the following. So uh, one of the suggestions was to include actors such as journalists and local researchers from universities to engage in the process. This will ensure accountability and also bridge the knowledge gap. I feel like having researchers from local universities is especially fruitful because they're embedded within the system already. And this can be, they can act as a knowledge hub and there's a process of continuity and sustainability in the process. So having these agents within the uh, process uh, will ensure more accountability. The second thing that we um, heard was the tracking the channelization of finances at all stages, uh, not just from the donors and at different stages of the whole process, just to ensure that the um, economic support that is provided, that the relief for, is provided, reaches the most vulnerable and does not um, get lost in the middle with middlemen. Um, and the third thing, I think uh, it was a more broader discussion and I tried to narrow it down, is to use first-hand data, especially data that has been obtained by grassroots leaders led by local NGOs. Um, they have a wider net uh, network and they have more information. So use first-hand data rather than refined data that is published. Um, and also to use community forums and local radios uh, to inform a community member so that the information is more easily accessible. So those, so not, those who have connections are not the only ones who are made aware. So I think these are the three points that came out of my discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone for very quickly facilitating the sessions and coming up with 
three and even four solutions. So I thought that was great. Now, without further ado, I would switch to our next segment, which is the reflection sec section with our uh, two speakers. Now I will hand it over to Dion to facilitate the session. Thank you, thank Dion, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon, and, and really wonderful experience to be part of this uh, project and, and this session. I think overriding message for me uh, from this session is that, you know, whilst we, we're celebrating the role that um, grassroots organizations play and the important role that they play in building a resilience, we should not do this in a way that, that shifts the burden of responsibility from those who have more resources and, and more power. So we should do it in a way which amplifies that investment uh, in this invaluable uh, resilience asset that we have in, uh, in, in grassroots organizations. So, a very, very strong message and, and I'm keen that we're able to take that forward. Uh, jo to join me in, the, in this last segment and wrapping up and, and, and uh, hearing thoughts of what they heard, we have uh, Johanna Palmberg, who's the Senior Policy Advisor from uh, the Swedish Inter International Development Agency, and Vincent Gainey from the newly formed uh, Foreign Commonwealth and, and Development Office, uh, previously known to all of us as, 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 as DFID, the component that uh, Vincent uh, represented previously. But um, the question I'm, I'm posing to uh, both Johanna and Vincent is, you know, what are the main messages that you will take back to your agencies from what you've heard in this session? And how can we together uh, amplify this investment and support grassroots organizations so that we have more resilient uh, communities for future shocks? Um, Vincent, I'm seeing you on screen, so I'll, I'll go over to you first. Thanks, Dion. Uh, pleasure to, uh, to join you this morning. Um, some really encouraging and powerful messages came out of this morning's session. Um, and I suppose what really struck me was how much, how, 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 uh, how many communities are prepared to self-organize and to actually um, take the initiative themselves. What also came very strongly was, and the messages coming from South Africa, uh, well, Bangladesh, Kenya, all of all of them really, was that the the, the sort of the gap still exists between um, government and local communities, uh, and despite the the severity and the seriousness of of the COVID crisis and the long term severity of the climate crisis, there still is quite a gap between governments being able to reach those communities. And I think a real sort of message is that there still needs to be some sort of interlocutor between government and community in order to give them the voice that needs to be heard at, at sort of local government level, at regional government level, at national government policy making level in, in order to be able to respond to those community needs. The demands are there, clearly the need is there but the resources aren't being directed for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I think um, that there's a lot still needs, to, there's a lot of work still needs to be done on creating the, the, the voice and, and the sort of empowerment at that local level for the governments to hear and then the governments to talk to us as donors and the donors to come together in consortia or, or sort, of, um, uh, sort of joint platforms where we can respond more effectively. Um, so, so very encouraging, but also realizing that we're still a long way along that road to go yet. Thanks, Dion. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Vincent. And yes, I think investing in that gap, closing the gap, I think uh, we've heard you know, really good examples of how um, many of these grassroots organizations are collecting vital information um, that is uh, critical to closing that gap with, uh, with municipalities, with local authorities, but uh, perhaps we can do more to bring uh, those uh, two uh, um, institutions together, grassroots organizations and, uh, and, and local authorities. Uh, Johanna, can I hand over to you, please? Yes, thank you, Dion, and thank you all for a very interesting morning. I will not uh, repeat what Vincent said because I actually agree with everything. But what I would like to bring to the table is the importance of these kinds of, of, of uh, sessions you know where we sort of realize that we are not alone there are so many grassroots uh, communities all over the world who who have similar problems they face problems with the administration and and their own administration and and we as donors can come in 
and uh, facilitate some of this and we can reach some uh, levels that a local uh, community or local organization cannot do and we do it at different levels uh, here we are, are at a more of a global level but but uh, the other thing that strikes me is exactly what came up this the resilience the fact that local communities actually say right no one is coming to help us what can we do there is someone there who, who will do it. And this, uh, we, in our little discussion group, we, 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 uh, Vincent brought up, and I, uh, I agree fully with that, it's very difficult for us at this level, at global level where I am now, to go in and directly uh, cooperate with someone at local level, even though I see the need for it. And therefore we have the different levels, in our case, bilateral, regional, and global level, and these different levels have different opportunities to to uh, connect people at, in in different ways. And I feel there are a number of organisations here today that actually receive funding from from uh, Swedish uh, the Swedish government, and the fact that we are joining them together is for me a, a huge step forward and as I, I said also in our group, it's not always a question of the money, it's a question of linking people to get them to understand we are not alone. Other people are, str people are struggling. We, we can learn from each other and, ha and this kind of uh, structure can, can facilitate that uh, by, by strengthening uh, the people morally that, that, that we are not here fighting in uh, uh, on our own there are plenty of other people and how can we we all play a role here thanks Joanna um, yeah a really strong message I think you know very often in these situations we we feel alone and in, in, in our various um, um, roles and, and I would imagine at, at a grassroots organization level that can be very much accentuated so this community, this dialogue becomes uh, very important. You spoke about working across scales. I think grassroots federations are so critical to allow us to, to reach across scales. So um, we, can, we can work with federations of grassroots organizations that can reach the, lo reach the local level quite quickly. So, so really, really important. But you know, returning back to your original point, uh, Johanna, before I hand over to, to Salim to wrap up, is, is the importance of dialogue and, and you know, seeing the different players we've had on this uh, session has been you know, critically important. And I hope that this community can continue to dialogue and continue to work together. Having development agencies, grassroots organizations, international organizations, all in the same virtual room talking about how we can take this forward is, is, is critical. Now we need to talk, uh, move the, the talking in, into action. So hoping we can do that uh, very soon. Salim, I will hand over to you for the final wrap up. seems like we lost Salim, unfortunately, at this moment. Yes, Sorry? I think I think he had a bit of a connection issue. Maybe he was uh, there for a while and I think we no longer have him here. Then. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, uh, Dion, you can uh, you can summarize the session in a bit. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sharon. And, and, and I, I was doing a little bit of a summary there. Um, so perhaps also just to thank everybody, partners, uh, ICAD, who played a critical role in this project, CDKN, um, uh, and uh, Slum Dwellers International, SDI. Thank you so much for initiating this work, uh, working together. This is a, a project that came together um, in a learning through doing uh, way. We didn't wait until we had an elaborate plan. We didn't wait until we were able to access uh, massive resources. We decided as organizations to move forward, to start this dialogue between grassroots organizations, inter international organizations and development agencies about how do we bolster, how can we invest more in grassroots organizations uh, due to the critical role that they play in uh, building resilience. So this is a, uh, a community that's uh, action oriented, that's working together. And, and we hope that this session has um, helped with that dialogue and that we will continue uh, to work together going forward. 
this, uh, these sorts of dialogues will continue. The Voices from the Frontline is a continuing uh, initiative. We will, uh, on a monthly basis, be getting together to continue to dialogue uh, and, and to find solutions and, and to find ways in which we can invest more in, in grassroots organizations going forward. So this is an ongoing dialogue and we, we, we would uh, certainly welcome you all to be part of this uh, journey with us. But thank you so much, uh, Sharon, for your excellent... Um, Thanks, Dion. Uh, I think uh, Salim has managed to join <laughs> us again. <laughs> Here we go. Sorry, uh, Dr. Hawk, if you can quickly say a few closing remarks. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just lost the connection uh, a, a few minutes ago. So um, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, everybody who participated in this excellent discussion uh, today in this session uh, for joining us. And I really enjoyed the contribution. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues from ICAD and CDKN uh, for organizing the event. I know a lot of work went into it. Uh, well done, everybody. Um, what I want to leave you with is uh, a challenge and an invitation. The challenge is groups that are taking place across the world and aggregate them at the global level. We we know the primary uh, interlocutor is local governments working with local actors. The secondary element is national governments and national actors. Um, but I want to avoid those two and I want to leapfrog to the global level. And my challenge, which is both to us, myself and all of us collectively, is how do we become more effective at the global level? Can we link all these different dots uh, along the map that uh, we had at the beginning and connect with each other more effectively than we've done in the past? Challenge. Opportunity is an invitation, is if you want to take this journey together with us, sign up. You know, tell us about it. And, and during the course of the next few days that we will be participating in this CBA 14 event together, let us link up with each other, get to know each other as much as possible. And then after the CBA 14 is over, we from our side, and I speak now on behalf of both ICAD and CDKN, we want to take this conversation forward. We don't want to stop here. We don't want to end here. There will be a report, there'll be an outcome, but we want to take this people connection forward. And I'll call it, uh, in my view, sort of, it is social capital versus the donors talking about finance capital. You know, we always focus on the finance capital, but to me, social capital is equally important and potentially equally powerful if we can harness it. And so that's the challenge I want to take up and invitation I want to give everybody of how do we enhance this social capital after CBA 14. And I'll give you two very specific um, dates along which we want to take this journey together. The, second, the first date is in January of next year, from the 21st to 24th of January. We will be organizing a major conference called Gobeshana. Gobeshana is a Bangla word for research. And we have a big theme on locally led adaptation and we want to bring all these grassroots groups together. So we will plan collectively for using that event to take our journey for, forward. And then next year, CBA 15 is going to be hosted in Bangladesh by BRAC and we want to become more effective there. So it's not just come together, talk to each other, have some good conversations and then we go home and we say, you know, go back to normal we want to move things forward if we're not moving things forward then in my view we're not doing enough just talking and networking not enough we have to take the agenda forward we have to set ourselves goals we have to fight for those goals move forward with those goals and we have to help each other to do them and so i leave you with this invitation please do uh, get in touch with us let us know if you want to uh, uh, be involved in this conversation going forward and we will sign you up uh, when we can, uh, so we can do this uh, going forward. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Shari.
Okay, thank you very much, Salim, for those closing words. And uh, thank you to, to everyone for having participated. Thank you to all of those of you who have managed to stay until now. We have gone a little bit over, but um, I think it was worth it. We have heard some, uh, yeah, some great contributions uh, throughout the session. So um, let us please, uh, with the closing, just have a final Mentimeter. You will see the link in the chat box. So we would just like to hear from you whether you have uh, um, learned something new today. We would like to get a sense of what that is. So if you're able to, um, to please fill in this last Mentimeter, we will be closing with this. And uh, once again, thank you to all the speakers, uh, the, the great contributions we heard from all levels, from the grassroots to the donors uh, to the uh, international partners. I think it's been a, a very varied at scale day to start with. So um, thank you again. And uh, let us see whether what are some of the takeaways you have had. I uh, don't see anything yet but i hope you're all filling in your lessons we see that about partnering with all actors will bring great results indeed we have really heard that and uh, we have strong partners so i think we uh, we really have the potential to do so for those of you who have to leave, bye-bye and thanks again. And if you do have the chance, uh, it will be great to see your, your lessons. Very inspiring. I wish it could help to continue community capacity building. Yes, indeed. And I think this whole conference will, will contribute to that. We have one about accountability in the middle. Don't let those with more power and resources off the hook. I agree very much with that. We all have a role to play. Grassroots groups should be treated as enablers and not beneficiaries indeed. Uh, there, uh, we see how much empowerment and capacity they have. So how can we work together once again? Strong partnership will help us to reach our goals. Empowering grassroots to manage transparency and accountability as using actors like journalists as well as publications. That also sounds important and it goes back to this accountability point. The importance of working through grassroots to reach local communities, encouraging local universities to be embedded in the process, also very important. Um, the role of another partner that perhaps we have not talked about as much, the, uh, the universities. Oh, very sorry that some of you are unable to access the Mentimeter, but please do contribute in the chat and I can, I can go and read also there. Community voices to demand or resources to support their resilience. Yeah, insights from donors was useful, but they still need to look at how connecting with grassroots rather than focusing on how it cannot work. Yeah, I think that is a very good point. So let's look at like, what can work and like how we can like let's look at the enablers rather than the, the barriers and the challenges i think that's something important because we're often experts at looking at challenges uh, stay strong and focused that's good we have a positive message so let's see god liver i have learned that networking and partnerships are very important but we need to take a step step forward and create an impact indeed so let us really work together for that. Um, I think with this, we can close uh, the, um, like uh, maybe one last point, maybe from the bottom. No, I think that's fine. Okay, so once again, thank you to everyone. All the best for the rest of the conference and the week, and we will be in touch uh, and meet probably in some of the other sessions. Best wishes, bye-bye. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone for joining just Bye, one everybody. last point i have shared my email address in the chat box again if you want to contribute in our vfl initiative please feel free to reach out to me and share stories thank you so much it's been and a i great, think we need uh, a, session with you. a special thank to shireen and her excellent facilitation yeah 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 well done mm -hmm. thank you so much <laughs> yes Thank you. And to the support team in the background, thank yeah. you so much. Everybody, Especially the two volunteers well and all Everybody. the facilitators. Thank you. Yes. Good thank you. Thank you very bye much. Bye, everyone. Bye thank bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks.
Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.